a letter of challenge from the God of Gods has arrived. This is the Golden Week challenge on Shogi Wars. Um, not really sure what to expect, because this seems to be the normal quiz section here. Where, okay, I see like a little new icon next to puzzle number 17. That's something. Um... Ah, based on how many we get accurate in this, we get a Donner Q rating for at least that challenge. Oh, I see. There's a challenge section. Ah, here we go. But before we get that, let's warm up on the one we just messed up, shall we? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll go back to the challenge section on the top, but as a little warm up just to show how puzzles work. And to make sure that my brain is actually working, uh, let's take a look. This is probably from one of my recent games. Um, so recently I have a decision to make between dropping a rook uh, or taking this pawn, and then they do rook takes, and it's, like, painful. Let's, let's guess this rook drop. That looks fun. Yeah. I played pawn takes in the actual games. So this is informing me that there's some tactical sequence justifying this particular rook drop. And here the knight does defend the pawn, so it's okay. So that's our warm up problem. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. So let's go on to the Golden Week challenge and see how we perform. <laughs> Set a 10 minute timer for the true experience? Oh dear. Are you joking about this? Do you really want a 10-minute timer? Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, let's just enjoy this together, and this will give me some time to comment on things as they're going. Challenge quiz problem number one. All right, so the last move is indicated as rook from 7-6 to 7-4. So... Pick option A or option B, A being rook, um, I'm sorry, no, the last move's not indicated. Okay, we have a choice between do you take the silver or do you retreat the rook? And this isn't one of those chess personality quiz things. Now, one observation here is that this bishop out here pins this pawn, so this is a free silver. It, I mean... How do you say no to a free silver? But maybe there's something fatally wrong with taking it? I very much doubt it. If you get 10 out of 10 correct, that's a 3 Don plus rank. Ooh. Awesome. You know, at some point I might have my own problem collections and judge my own strength, but it's interesting that the website has a standard way to do it. Taking the silver looks extremely appealing and it attacks the bishop and even if the bishop tries to move out of the attack like yeah there's i don't see any way this could be flawed let's try it yeah we got one and then you can hit the switch button to see like it would have been an even move to just retreat the rook and you would have missed your opportunity but here you take a free silver and the best continuation is they start an attack with this, and you can immediately use the silver, hitting this gold and hitting the pawn next to this exposed king. So, uh, sequence continues like this. You get a rook exchange, and be very happy with how this is played out. That's problem number one. I assume, uh, well, okay, this has one star. I don't know if the stars mean anything. Let's take a look at problem number two. We have a decision to make between pawn drop 8-7 or bishop drop 9-7. This bishop drop pins a rook. This pawn drop allows the rook to retreat or take sideways. Um, so unless I'm crazy, like, the bishop drop seems fantastic unless there's some absolutely mad tactic that like completely reverses things uh i can't uh, imagine anywhere better to drop the bishop here 
every other bishop drop seems pretty well covered, except maybe bishop drop 5-1. The bishop could escape there, but you could just block the escape. So like, this, oh, I'm sorry, no, you, there's no way to block the escape and also protect this goal. So there could be some value in holding the bishop in hand, but if you drop the pawn, then the rook retreats, and then this bishop drop doesn't exist anymore. So this has to be the move. There's no way this isn't the move. That's the move. Completely winning. If you had dropped the pawn, this would have been an even game. More or less. Uh, yeah, the rook retreats, and then you get to proceed with that attack normally. And having the bishop in hand is not so decisive here, even though you've got an attack rolling. Alright, so yeah, if you drop this bishop... Yeah, they break the pin, you get to take the silver, the rook retreats, and you get to give this check. I didn't look at it further than this in my mind, even though I didn't say this all aloud. This is as far as I got. Um, so yeah, they don't have a silver to block this bishop. If they had a silver, maybe this would not be so completely winning as it is. Here you get to take a knight, and this knight that you took allows you to threaten this fork. But yeah, like they could move the rook to an inactive file. Uh, you've got stuff in hand that you can deflect their bishop with. Oh, but I'm sorry. This blocks the bishop. That's even better. And yeah, it's not so clear how they can proceed here. If they do pawn takes pawn, you can start attacking the bishop directly and then later hit the rook and depending where the bishop moves, like, get your bishop active quickly again. So, that's good. It's good. Two out of two. Ah, this is the favorite button, so if you particularly like a puzzle, uh, you can favorite it. Okay. Let's see if we get a challenging puzzle this time. So we have a choice between drop a gold or promote a knight. Okay, these are starting to get more interesting. Um, so if I promote a knight, they can exchange either a rook for two pieces or a bishop for two pieces. If I drop a gold, both of my knights are blocked by the gold. Um, but I am threatened, well, I'm sorry, they have a silver attacking 5-3 as well. Uh, I just thought to check my overlay, and thankfully my overlay is fine. If I switch my overlay to this, it's not any better, so we'll stick with this view. Um, but yeah, sorry that this is clipped. Let me see if I can fix that. I don't think that's going to be too hard to correct. Yeah, so let's get the normal view here. This is puzzle three. So they have three pieces defending the square. If you exchange this, they can exchange a silver for two generals, and you do have this gold, and the gold can fork both of those pieces. But if you do gold drop, you also have a fork, and you get more pieces exchanged um, while their king is vulnerable. I like how this shows the duck legs castle and strategy. That's amusing. Um... Regretfully, this rook doesn't seem to be activating, no matter which move you play. Hmm. But yeah, if knight promotes, silver takes, gold drop forks these pieces, and then they have a knight and a bishop in hand, and they could... I don't know what they can do with that force immediately. Um, but they have... I don't like this position. I really don't. But a gold drop exchanges more pieces, so maybe it's less bad. Gold takes, or gold drops, silver takes, knight takes, and either they're giving up the rook or exchanging some more pieces. Um, I don't really see how to perpetually continue this attack, but we're going to bank on this and say it's probably good enough. I don't really get it, though. Takes, 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 takes. Pin. That's what I missed. Yeah, so this makes more sense to me now. If we just exchange two... Okay, well, yeah, the engine here recommends just uh, 
attack the bishop directly and that giving up your last attacking piece here is not worth it. I guess I would agree. Yeah, so yeah, both of these are somewhere in the somewhat even category. Uh, this is not completely decisive, but it's better than the alternative. So, all right, on to problem number four. We have a decision between 7-9 knight protecting our castle so we don't get checkmated, or take the silver and hope that we're not checkmated. <laughs> Good old hope, Shoki. Um, now... In many cases, I've dropped a piece to protect my king, and it's not been the perfect defensive piece, and I've gotten checkmated. So I should start first by looking, okay, can we take the silver? And I think the answer is a pretty clear no, that if we take the silver, um, I thought this silver drop here king retreats knight promotes looks extremely terrifying due to a dual checkmate threat here as well as they can capture more pieces and continue menacing our king but if we drop a knight to defend then knight takes knight takes and like i don't know if the attack abates either way um Hmm. It's not so clear to me. Ideally, we would just be able to checkmate them by sacking the correct piece, but we don't have the pieces we need to checkmate here. We'd need to move the token one closer, and it's still not quite enough. Um, so... Yeah, my impulse would be to drop the knight and hope that it's good enough. But in practice, that generally doesn't work. Um, but taking the silver looks extremely dangerous. Yeah, because the other thing to consider is if we take the silver, they drop a silver king over, they drop a gold king back. Maybe we survive that? I don't know. This is not easy for me. Okay, so I'm glad to see, like, I'm not crazy. This one is actually challenging. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing them there checkmating me after I take the Silver General. And if they are not checkmating me, then I should take it. Because, yeah, playing these extra pieces in defense just tends to wear you down over time. Um, so, again, we're doing this for entertainment as well as assessment. I think the correct move is to take this, because we could really use the silver to help us attack. We're threatening a silver drop, and then we'd exchange there, and it's just the right piece for our attack. And I'm not seeing how they checkmate us here. It's really close. But I don't think they have a mate, so I think we should be unafraid and just take it. Yeah, so if we look at the alternative, the 7 9 knight drop, they take the bishop. Yeah, they don't even have to take this right away, and like this knight drop hasn't changed the situation. And yeah, then they can drop the bishop, and then this is also a check here, so we have to block with another piece. And this is just terrible. Um, so, Night Drop doesn't do anything. The Silver Capture gives us a piece that we could use to help attack, although I don't see how it works. Okay, so they, the engine recommends Skull Drop instead, and this crazy like series of sacrifices to keep the attack going. What I'm missing here, though, is like, what if they are more patient in this position? What if they promote the knight, and then, having lost a tempo, then they, like, take a bishop afterward? Do we have mate here? 
Oh, we have a gold general in hand. When did that show up? We've always had a gold general in hand. All we needed to join that was a silver, and now we are actually threatening mate. So they have to do everything with check at this point. And that's the point. And it's not illustrated in the variations here, because it's kind of implied. So yeah, we're four for four. Not bad. All right, we have a decision between exchanging bishops or dropping a pawn, hitting this bishop. Hmm. Um. Um. Hmm. <laughs> this is vexing. This is so vexing. If I exchange bishops, then I could drop a bishop here attacking the rook. That's the advantage of exchanging the bishops. If we drop the pawn, they retreat their bishop and attack our float. No, this, yeah, it's floating, but it's okay. But we don't have an attack as far as I can tell. Like, their attack continues unless we do this exchange. And if we do the exchange, then we could do this. Uh, I guess the point isn't even that we're going after the king. It's that we're hitting the rook and the knight. And if the rook protects the knight, then we deflect the rook and then take the knight. So, like, this seems to straight up win a piece. Yeah, so rook takes, bishop drop, and yeah, we straight up win a piece. This allows them to uh, save face a little bit. Oh, goodness. But now if they're going after our king, we can pursue theirs. That's cool. I didn't see this. But that's really nice. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's impressive. Whereas what I saw is, like, if I chase the bishop... Okay, I didn't think they would exchange here willingly. But, yeah, they can redrop it and approach our position this way. And they're in control. They've gained a tempo at a time where they very much needed the tempo. And they just got it, and, like, everything collapses. So, like, I was seeing this, that we were giving a tempo here needlessly, where here we could take the reins and force the opponent to react to what we're doing. Five for five, not bad. Maybe not good, I don't know. It's okay. I sense these are probably going to get harder. <laughs> hey, guess what? Problem number six is a little bit more challenging. Hmm, do we pick the yellow button or the red button? <laughs> All right, let's go back and see. Uh, can we get this problem set? Okay, there we go. Yeah, blind shogi. Now... Like, on Lee Chess, I introduced blind puzzle mode. It is actually a thing. They give you the move list, and if you feel so motivated, you could replay the move list and, like, solve puzzles blind. And it is brutal, but it tests your ability to play blind chess. Um, as well as see tactics. This, this, uh, yeah, this is different. So we have a choice. Do we blunt the bishop's path? Or do we harass the rook? My first impulse here is, of course, we block the bishop. Silvers and bishops are meant to fight against each other. Chasing a rook with a silver just generally has never worked for me. So unless there's some super special reason that this attacking the rook is a good idea, it just isn't. That's just... but... um. Maybe there is some special consideration here. So if we hit the rook, it can retreat. Um, and yeah, I don't know what we do next there. We do have two pawns in hand, but I'm not impressed. Uh, further, like if we spend our silver here, this diagonal is wide open and like, okay, yeah, we could block the bishop with a pawn, but it's going to take us a long time to get anything done. So, surely, oh, this is 5-5 five, five pawn, not 5-5 five, five silver. 
Um, that's a little different. Okay. My pawn. Interesting. Um, I don't know that 5-5 five five pawn gains a tempo here. It seems to... Well, blocking the scope of the bishop is good in general. If 5-5 five is going to collapse, then we shouldn't do it, but it might take some time to collapse, and we might be able to pull some tactics in the interim. Attacking the rook directly has... It feels good, but it doesn't do anything useful. Um, I'm just trying to see if 5-5 five five pawn like runs into some tactical refutation, but I don't think it does. Yeah, so it's an unpleasant position. If we do 5-5 five five pawn, they could do 5-4 pawn. And then we could like drop the silver and take the pawn and do other stuff. But um, now then they do bishop takes or pawn takes. Hmm. I mean, they don't want to play 5-4 pawn. That's not why they played this opening. Plus, we can hit this knight immediately. So, like, if we drop pawn 5-5, five five, they can drop pawn 7-6. And we lose a knight. And we're not doing anything. Um, whereas if we hit the rook directly, it moves. So we drop a pawn. We collect this. Um, they get some tactics too, but this pawn drop is not with gain of tempo. Yeah, pawn five five does blunt the bishop, but it's too slow here. Um, it's a beautiful move, but it doesn't really do much. It allows them to counterattack quickly with like a silver drop and a pawn drop and like another pawn drop. It just loses a tempo straight out, whereas this at least forces them to react. The rook can't swing over to the center file, so it has to retreat. Then we could drop a pawn and then win the... Oh, now I understand why you don't drop the pawn directly. Because like, yeah, the rook would take it immediately. So yeah, we do this to prep the pawn drop and then... Yeah, we have initiative. Yeah. Let's see, how bad is this? So it's an even position. Okay, ah. This is even more clever than the pawn drop attack. I thought there was something I was missing here. Yeah, so this is what I didn't see. Uh, but yeah, they have to retreat, and then we get to collect the knight. And after collecting the knight, we can kick the rook again. Apparently this is 576 points better, or centipons better. Um, interesting. Okay, so this is how we could use the rook gainfully. Because the knight protects the rook's ears. So yeah, I could see that. We don't get to attack the king right away, which is why I struggled with this. But yeah, we do get an initiative. Alright, I'm into problem seven. Um, so we're attacking... wait. Really? Okay, they have pawns in hand, so this isn't as simple as takes takes and just like completely mopping up. Um, so... Yeah, by completely mopping up, I mean that if they can't drop a pawn in front of our rook here, we are also threatening to take that, and that we could just dodge the silver and press on some attack somehow. So the impulse reaction here, after seeing that there's not a... after they have this pawn drop here, is that, you know, it doesn't seem like this rook takes, rook takes pawn drop is fast enough to do anything useful. Uh, so unless, like, rook takes pawn drop, bishop takes, and then they win the free rook. Unless that somehow works out. Like, tactically, it seems that bishop takes pawn is forced. But, you know, we're on problem seven. 
these problems are probably getting harder and harder. On the other hand, this rook is floating, so if we can manage to exchange bishops, then we can drop a bishop and do this fork. So, yeah, this kind of forces a bishop exchange. Her own king is temporarily safe enough. Like, I can't find a way to justify this rook madness here. It just, like, loses a rook. So, we're going to try this and hope that we're right. Okay, they are randomly assorted, but we're guaranteed to have a set difficulty range. Okay. So this is just me psyching myself out. So rook takes, pawn drop. Oh, they don't even have to drop a pawn to deal with this. Yeah, further, like, I don't know what I was thinking. A pawn drop here is not protected by anything in this vicinity, but this uh, does shut down the rook's attack. And yeah, we have to now finally move our bishop, and we've completely lost the tempo, and you know, yeah, bad stuff happens. Which is kind of counterintuitive, because we have Mino Castle. It's just we have, like, no attack. Uh, so uh, Mino Castle doesn't allow you to perfectly defend against rook drops. Whereas here, this is kind of interesting, and yeah, this bishop threat winning this silver, oh, oh, I guess combined with this threat on this gold general forces the opponent to react. Okay, we don't want to exchange rooks here for the reason we saw just a second ago. <laughs> we get to, like, unwind the tactic too. Um, that's interesting. So yeah, pawn takes, and silver takes, and pawn drop again, and, you know, we have something. Um, it's not decisive, but it's something. I'm curious what the next moves would be here, though. So we've... Yeah, they have a horse in the corner. And perhaps it'd be best if we just dropped a bishop on this long diagonal and hope to get a knight to join our attack soon. Uh, that way we don't end up getting both pieces in the corner. But we've got something here. The evaluation here is 412. Um, yeah, I'm kind of not optimistic about my chances against most opponents here. But apparently it's fine. Yeah, I, I don't get it. It is nice to have this attack on the king's head, so we could take... Silver takes pawn drop and something follows but i don't get it if we could like somehow get another attacking piece on there with another knight or a lance or something that'd be cool but that ain't happening uh but yeah alternatively we're just in a world of trouble if we play the other way so this will have to do um so now we're given a choice between two one bishop drop or pawn from one five or one six to one five what? What? What is this? Unless the bishop drop is a terrible move, like, why would you do a pawn move? Um, so we're clearly trying to promote our rook. If we promote our rook, then potentially more good stuff could happen. This pawn advance oh, is patient and does allow us to threaten to push this again and exchange more pieces and try to promote our rook not on the second file but on the first file. They do already have a pawn on the second file, so it's not like they can use a pawn to resist our rook. So we do have time to push this multiple times and then try to break the edge. 2-1 bishop actually doesn't do anything useful. It does attack this gold, but otherwise traps our bishop. So, unless there's some tactic that loses the rook... Yeah, pawn 1-5 might actually be best. I know I was stunned about this problem, but... Like, it seems straightforward to push. 
Say they drop their bishop to hit our lance. We push again. They take our lance. We take this pawn. They take our knight. And it's... Oh, wait. How's this go? Pawn 1, 5, bishop. I mean, we don't have to give up the lance, right? We could play lance 1, 6. And their bishop provokes, and then we push pawn 1, 4. And we're just barely in time, but... Um, after the dust settles, though, I don't think our rook promotes on this edge. I don't think it's good enough. This bishop drop does threaten to take the gold, and then we could easily promote the rook. Oh, I was thinking that if we took the gold, both of us would get a gold general, but no, they'd get a bishop. The bishop can't really fight easily against this rook. Yeah, this is... I thought this was going to be pushing this pawn. I'm confused. Bishop. Bishop. Uh, Well, no, they're not going to play that here, are they? How would I defend if my opponent dropped a bishop here? Aside from panicking. Would I defend? Would I counterattack somehow? I don't see a compelling counterattack. A bishop doesn't seem like the correct piece to crack this open. So the fact that bishop 2-1 is considered at all makes me think that like this has to be good if it's reasonable. Um... Because, yeah, this silver that we'd hit afterward, they'd have to, like, defend with their rook or something. And then we could take the slants. I don't see how this perpetually flows as an attack, but it is an initiative that we're building. We would have a gold general in hand. Um, if we were to exchange here... So I guess the main concern is, what if we hit this gold and they just step away? Uh, and then we just promote, and we don't have to give up anything. Okay, so that's not happening. Okay, if we put this bishop here, what if they block our rook with a bishop? Um, if we take, gold takes, and then we take a silver for free, and we're threatening to like surround the rook and take the knight and all that so like yeah we get a really nice initiative from being willing to temporarily part with some material um if we do exchange and then we promote the rook do they have a way to support this silver hmm. i don't see a good way for them to support it yeah, so this bishop drop gets one hell of an initiative going. Um, okay, what if we drop the bishop, they exchange the rook for it? That looks acceptable as well. Um, yeah. This one looks tough, but looking at variations, I think pawn 1-5 is just too slow. And 2-1 bishop seems to get one hell of an initiative going. I wonder what uh, Shogi Wars thinks. Okay, so this is correct. Let's first look at the alternatives. So this is an even game. Bishop drop. We move the lance. This promotes. <laughs> then 2-1 bishop because we don't have anything better. And the engine recommends, like, what have you been doing? And yeah, we just cry. Because this is just such a difficult position and we weren't able to break the edge. Here, if we play 2-1 bishop, uh, yeah, our opponent can play 2-8 bishop, but I didn't think that was a reasonable way to retort here, but I guess it's the best thing they can do. Uh, they don't have a way to, like, ensnare this. So, and, yeah, this knight is not able to go anywhere useful, so they're able to protect the silver. I missed this. This would have made my analysis easier. If I knew that I was going to just mop up, yeah, I would have considered this much more easily.
So I was more discouraged by the alternative here, Pawn 1-5. Um, it was more of a process of elimination saying, well, the alternative didn't seem to work in my mind. So we picked this, but not for the right reason. But it was good enough. So 8 out of 8. Yeah, it looked tough, but Pawn 1-5 was not good. So if they'd given us a different position where there were a slightly better alternative, I could have failed that because I just had a really hard time parting with my bishop. Let's go on to problem nine. Okay, so we have a decision between bishop takes gold on 6-1 or knight drop at 7-5. Okay, oh boy. <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, well, observation number one is that if we drop this knight, they could just drop something in front of our bishop and we cry. And we are very, very, very sad for not having taken the moment and seized it. Yeah, this isn't the middle game. This We're getting very close to an end game here. So... Unless somehow, like, does bishop takes gold get us mated? Mmm. That would be wild. That would be absolutely crazy if bishop takes got us mated here. Um, but no, like, 7-5 knight drop... They put any blocking piece on 4-3, and we are extremely sad about how none of our pieces are able to do anything. So, like, this has to be right, and if it's not, we just fail the problem. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Plus 2,346 if you play this, because you ain't going nowhere here. Oh, they don't even have to block our bishop? Okay, well, I assumed incorrectly that, like, somehow this knight drop would actually lead somewhere. It just doesn't lead anywhere whatsoever, other than to our getting checkmated. Okay, that's even worse. Uh, so we take, and then they take our bishop. Okay. Yeah, because they have a mate threat, so we have to respond to it. I didn't see that. So, yeah, this gets our hanging bishop and does something useful with it. And now we got a silver and a gold for this bishop. Yeah, they drop a silver. Like, the alternative seemed so bad that I wasn't willing to uh, entertain the thought that, like, both variations are bad. But imagine, like, you're in some other position, you're having to figure out, can you defend this or not? Um, apparently the best attacking move they have is not a bishop drop out here, it's not some other drop on this side. It's not even dropping something in defense of their king, because I don't understand why not. Like, I would be very tempted to drop a silver right there in 7-2. Um... But apparently that's, yeah, then like silver 7-1, and then they just take, okay, so. There's nothing they can do to defend their king better here. Silver 7-1 somehow is not great. I don't get that. But yeah, if they do this check first, and then they take the lance, uh, our attack continues unabated here. Um... And so that is a mate threat, and we do have to deal with it here, but um, apparently we don't get mated in this line. But yeah, the alternative sucked, so I, I didn't want to believe that both variations were bad. Um, yeah, I'm still very confused um, what's going on here. Very, very confused. So we've chased the king out of the corner, and our opponent is threatening mate in one, but we're better. 
But yeah, again, the alternative sucked, so what can you do? Let's try the next one. All right, so we have a decision between dropping a rook, or I'm sorry, moving our existing rook from where it's at to next to our king, or a uh, bishop takes rook. Um, we have a gold, a lance, and a pawn in hand here. If we move our rook, they are going to play rook to eight one or 8-9, promoting it, working our lance and our gold general. So if we try to save our rook, um, like they get a free tempo hitting our gold general. And sure, we could move our golds and run away from their attack. And they would get to promote just this onslaught of lots of pieces against us. And our rook would never become active ever again. Alternatively, if we exchange rooks here, then I want somehow to trap this king so we can attack it from both directions. Um, I don't see a completely decisive attack after taking it. And sure, after taking the rook, then we could take a knight, and maybe somehow things be great there. A knight would be a decent attacking piece. But yeah, this rook retreat just looks like such a lemon that like we have to exchange rooks. It's the only way that we're ever going to prosecute an attack here. Oh, I guess fortunately for us, they don't have additional generals they can defend their king with. So like, there's a ton of attacking potential after we take here. This has to be right. It is. So yeah, the alternative here is we run with our rook. They promote there. Okay, I only thought about moving this gold over, and if they harass it, continuing to move this, or they could harass things other ways, but um, instead, yeah, we've done, uh, okay, we can attack here. Our bishop's going to be difficult to activate now that they've got multiple pieces protecting this, and they built up a castle, and it's sad. It's... You know, the tricky part about this is that we're better in both variations. If we ran with the rook, I know I said this sucked, but it's not that bad. I'm just more referring to the fact that, like, if I'd played a move like this, like I've played in other games where I've tried to keep my rook, it's a bad feeling. And if you play enough bad feeling moves, then your position degrades, like, the same way that Dr. Tarosh said so that, you know, if you, um, something about, um, weaknesses and bearing the germs of defeat, if you just instill too many weaknesses into your own position, um, that, like, ultimately you're going to struggle defending this. Um, yeah, uh, if we'd got the score in 10 minutes, we'd have an estimated strength of 3 down plus. Yeah, so this really underscores the importance of drilling the positions. So I don't know that I could have gotten all this in 10 minutes as it currently stands. It does give me ideas for um, developing our own Bratko Kopic test. So we don't necessarily have to rely on this particular puzzle corpus. Um, so yeah, I think this took us about a half hour to get through. If I'm timing things. Oh no. It took longer than that. Um, but yeah, the key to making it to one don, two don, three don, etc. is to solve the problems, get the correct answers, and do it quickly. So that's uh, kind of similar to out a chess tournament scene. Um, well, let me, before we go there, let's take a look at this. Uh, so if we exchange the rooks, we can take the knight, like I was saying, drop the rook, like I was suggesting, and I wasn't sure how to continue this attack, but this knight drop looks fine. Yeah, we have a castle, and they kind of have a castle, and we have some initiative, we've got this horse, be even better if somehow we have just 
a slightly more solid position than we currently have, but you know, it's not mate, but it's quite good. Um, so yeah, back to the larger idea. So yeah, the idea with uh, chess tournament performance is just the you get a higher and higher rating by being more and more consistent at making good decisions under time pressure. That's the way that tournament performance is measured. You have to find the moves within the time control of the match or the tournament. And so there are two schools of thought about this. Uh, you'll find, at least in the Lee Chess forums, um, two schools of thought about how to get good at Blitz Chess or Bullet Chess. One school of thought goes, okay, um, yeah, so just play a ton of Bullet Chess and just keep playing it and eventually you'll get the hang of it. You might have to study some of your games. You might have to like somehow do something, but like playing tons and tons of Bullet will get you better at Bullet. That's the one school of thought. I completely disagree with it, but, um, you know, some people believe that if you just play it a lot, that, you know, quantity over quality, that's going to help. Um, and the only extent to which that might be true is perhaps if you're playing too slow of games on the other flip side of things. If you just are constantly playing very slow games that are met with opponents that take lots of time, and maybe these aren't even the most critical games you could be playing against the best possible opposition, that you could be losing time playing longer games. Fair enough, but yeah, I think the way to get better at playing faster games, and the way to get better at solving puzzles quickly, is probably to spend time uh, solving things and playing games at slower time controls and gradually pick up the pace. That's, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's the first school of thought, even though I completely disagree with it, it is a school of thought, and many players do agree with it, that by playing tons and tons of games, you actually hear in like the Go community, that a uh, great way to learn is to lose your first hundred games or something and really get a wide breadth of experience and hopefully you're learning something from that. So if you're playing tons of slow games, yeah, it's maybe not the best use of time, but I think slower games and then gradually picking up the pace step by step, you probably are going to have a better time doing that. The same way you would like to learn an instrument, not by quickly blitzing through a section over and over, but by gradually playing with a metronome and doing things under uh, a routine. The same way like an Olympic athlete doesn't do a crazy stunt without any warm-up or practice first, but like they gradually ramp up to this sort of thing. So... I'm more of this latter school of thought that, you know, uh, sure, you can learn a lot by playing against opponents in lots and lots of quick games. And this, it could be fun too. I mean, there's a certain morale aspect to it where, yeah, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're not going to learn either way. So, yeah, there's definitely a point to both schools of thought. I don't at all agree with or subscribe to the first school of thought, but it is a school of thought. Many people think that, yeah, you can learn that way effectively. And until we have data to say one way or the other, who's to judge, right? So let the experts and masters judge. Sure, I get it. But um, yeah, I don't think that doing everything quickly with the timer ticking is necessarily the best environment for learning. It's a great way to test whether you have learned, but I don't think it's a great mechanism for learning. But anyway, uh, yeah, we went 10 out of 10. If we'd done this within 10 minutes, yeah, then this would be a three Don plus performance. So the fact that it's taken me so long to solve these and we saw how my thoughts varied all over the place, uh, and it took me a long time to come to good realizations, shows that I've just got a ton to practice and learn 
and figure out how I can think about my thoughts more effectively than I currently do. Um, the fact that like sometimes I would only get the correct answer by virtue of having rejected every other solution first, just through process of elimination, saying, well, the alternative sucks, therefore we have to do this. Um, especially with that 2-1 bishop, I had difficulty with that problem. Um, I didn't want to place the piece in a way that it clearly would be trapped and that like I couldn't find a way to win material thereafter and it was so far away from the king and like it took me a long time to realize no this is actually how high level games go sometimes is you actually have to place your pieces and sacrifice them so you can promote your other pieces even not for material gain in the short term like you can get positional gain which I guess does convert to material gain soon enough. But anyway, uh, those were a lot of interesting puzzles. That was uh, the Golden Week set of 10 problems, the challenge here. So yeah, if we manage to solve all 10 of these within uh, a time frame. Uh, okay, this forgot that I solved it, so we're going to solve it again. Um, if we gotten all these solved within the time frame, then um, yeah, this would have counted as a three dawn level performance. Uh, but that's not how we did it. We took our time. We got the right answers, and I think we've learned some things for it, without getting too mad at ourselves about it. So yeah, best of luck to anybody else attempting this challenge. I guess I didn't realize how interesting some of these problems would be, or perhaps at the head of the video I would have encouraged people try it yourself first, but it's too late for that. Anyway, yeah, I hope we enjoyed that, and thanks for watching.